90.3 WHPC, the voice of Nassau Community College. Welcome to another edition of From the Press Box here every Monday morning, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., as we are part of the WHPC Sports Talk family. Uh, Sports Talk's on 4 to 5 every Monday through Friday and Tuesdays, 10 p.m. to 12 midnight. But, of course, with everything going on in the world, sometimes it might be... uh, preempted but most of the times it's not my name is rob leonard joining me of course is my brother and award-winning sports writer tim leonard and uh hello brother how we doing good morning brother how are you i'm doing okay good seeing you yesterday by mistake um okay because you've been in lockdown for a while and i uh i brought a, a a thing of food for my brother a care package as it's called in other places and uh, it was nice to bump into you by mistake because, you know, technically you've locked yourself in, which is, you know, your choice. And, uh, and I had to go to the drugstore yesterday. We, we are in a pandemic. I know some people yeah. don't think that, but we are. We are. Um, first of all, brother, before we start anything, because I don't want to uh, lose the thought on this. This past weekend, brother, for, for people like us, New York Knicks fans and uh, New York Islander fans, MSG just did it right. Um for Islanders and Knicks fans. First of all, uh, they had games four and six of the 2002 uh, playoffs between the Islanders and the Maple Leafs. Maybe the greatest series the Islanders ever played and lost. And it was just... Oh, was that, it was just a, that was the Lanny, the Lanny McDonald goal, right? Uh, no, no, no. Or am I thinking no, earlier? I'm you're thinking, thinking earlier. Thinking, uh, you're thinking Ty Domi. Thing Ty Domi acting like a, um, you know, a klutz that he was, and and it was, I forgot in Game Five that Michael Pecker had a cheap shot done to him, and that the Islanders in Game Six had to destroy the uh, the Maple Leafs to get to Game Seven, which they lost the Islanders um, uh-huh. because what happened was everyone won their home games, and the Islanders had a three game home game series, and and the Maple Leafs had the fourth, but. You know, I still watch that Sean Bates goal in game four. Um, still one of the great moments in Islander history. And I was there at that game. I was there at two, four, and six in 2002. I was there with our friend Rob Tuck. And it was just a, just a, an incredible series. Of the, you know, they, they talk about the Coliseum as a barn. It, the, the term, I think, started. I know it, it probably was used maybe beforehand, but it really started in that series because – it was such a intense uh, series, uh, intensely played, but the uh, the crowd was just so into it because this is the first time the Islanders in the playoffs in uh, like a hundred years, and we had new ownerships that seemingly had money, and it was Maybe just not a hundred, brother. Well, you know what I mean. Long time. Yeah, it was. It was, a, it was a long time, and so it was great to see these things. Then on Sunday, MSG Plus played all four clinchers of when the Islanders won the Stanley Cup. And, you know, that Nystrom goal on March 20, um, on May 24th, 1980, was, is still one of the great things to watch every time because you know what I like about the goal, brother? He, Tell he me, bro. Didn't, he didn't grab the puck and then try to trick out the uh, goaltender. He just sort of just stuck his stick out, and it went off, and it goes right in. Just you redirect know? it. Simple. Simple hockey. Was, it was so simple and so perfect. And uh, just watching the crowd go crazy of the 1980 goal is just and, – and you know what? I didn't realize this. Nystrom scored a goal earlier in the game. Yeah. I'm watching the, I'm watching the game. And the annou- yeah, and Nystrom scores a goal. The announcer goes, uh, Nystrom's going to remember that goal forever. You know, scored in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and meanwhile, you know, you know, a period later, he scores the yeah. goal. You he's know, gonna, he's going to get a bigger one. Yeah, so um, it's it's just it was so much fun to watch all four games back to back in two hour cut down, um, in a two hour cut down. So I was just so happy to see that as an Islander fan. You know, just as we're all locked inside, it was nice to see something. That was really cool. And then the other thing they did on MSG on the other channel, they had the Knicks from 1999. And, 20, uh, 21 years ago when, when the last time the Knicks were good. Yep. And uh, first of all, you see Jeff Van Gundy looking, wow. <laughs> he looked 
beaten up. You see him uh, today doing the games Are on ABC. Said, wow, I thought I thought that meant he looked good. No, he he looked beaten up. His eyes were just you know all wow. black. He looked, he looked like, like that. He's looked like that since he was in his late twenties. Yeah, I know, but it was much more noticeable during the games. But if you think about that '99 team, um, they first of all they played the Pacers that year, and the Pacers were maybe the most equal team for the Knicks to play. It was just they're very similar teams. Um, and also, 99, Patrick Ewing got hurt. And Correct. this was this was a, a very good team playing without Patrick Ewing that made yeah, the finals. And then Larry Johnson got hurt during that game. Yep. So um, they showed two of the Pacer games, uh, you know, on MSG+. Plus. So it was, it was nice to see, first of all, the Knicks winning and, and, and games that mattered. And it was also just fun to see that 99 team because a lot of times MSG shows the 93, 94 teams. And it was nice seeing it not against uh, Chicago. It was nice seeing it against the Pacers who, you know, I would consider them the Baltimore, uh, Baltimore bullets of um, competition for that era's team. When you think of, you know, the 69, 70 teams and then the teams that followed afterwards, the Bullets were the ultimate team for them to beat, not the Lakers. And uh, Frazier said that many a time, that the, the Bullets were very similar to uh, the Knicks and everything. So it was it was nice okay. to see both. I'm going back and forth in the games watching it. I don't have picture and picture on my TV, um, but I was just going back and forth. It was a, a fantastic thing to watch on on Saturday and Sunday. So I just wanted to get that out of the way. And I... I yeah, you know, I guess they have to show some Devils wins now because they won the Stanley Cup three times. So, Nothing wrong with some Devils wins. I covered some of those wins. So I know. So it'd be nice to uh, you know get your opinion if they show them to see uh, what you what what you did because you did cover some of those games uh, as you said. Yeah. Mm, so my 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 recollection. I tell you what, and this this goes for this goes for the majority of sports writers. If you ask them about specific games right a lot a lot of sports writers or former sports writers they really won't be able to tell you very much because you're writing while the game is going especially especially during a world series or during a stanley cup final that's why i mean i I, i've told this story before but i was i was given an assignment in uh, during a stanley cup final and right. it was it was to write a, 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 a pregame feature about a Devils player whose name I can't even remember right now, and he winds up scoring a goal in the first period. He he was he he was in like his thirteenth season or something like that in the NHL. Been around the NHL for a long time, hadn't been a key guy for any teams. You know, it was just kind of a guy who made a career out of it. Sometimes he was in the minors, but most of the time he spent in the NHL. And this was his first taste of the playoffs final. Well, like I said, he scores a goal in the first period. I'm thrilled because now all I have to do, you know, my, my life has been made easier by this goal because all I have to do now is just get a couple of quotes after the game, plug them into my story, and I can pretty much do the same story. All I got to do is just update the quotes. Well, I find out very late in the third period, like with about three minutes left in the game, that – our columnist at the Bergen Record, who I'm sure all the listeners know because now he's on ESPN, Adrian Wojnarowski. He used to be the columnist at the Bergen Record. He decides he wants to write about my guy. Actually, I just remember his name, Bobby Corkum, C-O-R-K-U-M. Okay. So he decides with three minutes left in the game, he's going to write about Bobby Corkum. I'm like, what do I do? You know, I, I, I don't even know what this. So my sports editor – calls and and we start talking he's like oh write about he goes how about this how about write about Brodor I'm like I haven't watched a single thing Brodor has done all game I'm like I, I don't even know what to write I, I don't know the best save he made I wrote I, I was I was I was watching Corkum I was writing my story I was updating it I was you know taking some notes doing that I wasn't watching Brodor you have to be watching as a sports writer you can go the whole game and and know somebody played fairly well, but not know why or not know specifics. And that was one of those nights because that's not what I was there to do. So all of a sudden they switch gears, and I still remember it was the most embarrassed, most embarrassed I was in a post game press conference 
right, was right. when I had I had to ask Martin Brodeur. So Martin, what do you think your best save of the night was? And it's such a garbage question because yeah, but basically, a lot of times they ask that. You know, I know, but for me, it's it's like I would rather be able to ask and say, "Well, Martin, the, you know that that save you made on whoever in this in the second period." I, I thought that was maybe your best save of the night. What do you think? You know, or, or well, what did you yeah, think I of that understand. save? Yep. We're back. We had some technical difficulties, but we're back here on 90.3 WHPC. From the press box, I'm Rob Leonard. He's Tim Leonard. We're talking about the the NFL draft. Um, of course, uh, it is going to be a little different than the, like I said, the, broad, the Broadway-style shows that they normally do with the NFL draft, um, you know, with Roger Goodell acting like uh, um, like he's the star sometimes, which he isn't. Uh, Not to every commissioner, bro. Don't, don't rip on Goodell for that. Every commissioner does that. Come on. Well, you know, you know, they all think they're they all think they're they're dishing out millions of dollars. It's, 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 it's their it's their day to be a star. You know, I mean, every every other day in a commissioner's year. Is, is he's being criticized or booed or you know, nobody likes commissioners? It's well, very you know what they like David Stern. Commissioner. David Stern they yeah, like. People like David Stern because he made the NBA a, a, a very popular and he grew it and 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 he did a lot of good things. But people hate Gary Bettman and, oh, and, I, and they, they they despise Roger Goodell. Right, I know that. Roger Goodell is a guy who tried to take. Roger Goodell is a guy who tried to take the fun out of football. I know, and 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 for some reason, everyone just hates Batman. You know, I <laughs> just yeah. Everyone no, it's not for some reason; it's for good reason. <laughs> you know, you know. The I remember uh, one year the de- when the Devils won the Stanley Cup, there was talk they were going to move because you know they wanted a new arena, and um, right. Batman was like, "Well, if you're not going to support the arena," and then he comes out to give out the cup, and and, and the Devil fans went after him tremendously. Of course, they did. And, and then, of course, Islander fans. Uh, Batman's like, well, you really can't go back to the Coliseum. You know, there, there are a lot less seats now. It's not really a major league uh, facility now. Well, guess what? Next year, the uh, literally the entire season, if there is one, will be played at the Nassau Coliseum. So, and if there is playoffs, they'll be played at the Coliseum. So, yeah, um, but that's that's why that's why that's why a, a commissioner shouldn't talk about stuff like that necessarily. And, and I mean, if if an owner wants to play his games or his team's games in a in a twelve or thirteen thousand seat arena. Why Batman shouldn't care as long as the bills are paid. That's you know, hey, he's going to lose some money, but that's up to him. Yeah, and actually, the oh. Islanders are fourteen thousand. You know, it's basically close. It's thirteen nine five or something. Right, so whatever, whatever it is, it doesn't even matter. You know, Ledecky and who's the other guy? I always forget the other guy's name. I forget. The, I always forget. Ledecky's well, always out there. So yeah, but they can I, afford I, it. Yeah, they, they can. They're not hurting okay. money. They got to have know? a nice arena and, or two years. So exactly. So they'll make so. the money back eventually. So, brother, the, the Giants are at number four on the pick. The Jets at number eleven. What what do you think the Giants need, or what should the Giants do? That number four pick is is tradable to maybe get something. Oh, it's very tradable. I mean, there, there's even talk. There's been some, a little bit of rumbling that the Lions might look to be trading the number three pick, and that genuinely is the worst thing that could happen to the Giants because right now, as far as I'm concerned. If Dave Gettleman doesn't make at least one trade, and really two trades, he should be fired on Friday. And, well, and that Dave Gettleman, happen. this is this is what this is what this is what scares me, is Dave Gettleman has never traded down in a draft. But the Giants are in such perfect position to not only trade down twice, but to still get the player that they would take it for at number six. All right, brother. Let me let me tell you what what the ideal situation for the New York football giants would be for this coming Thursday. First it involves our man Dave Gettleman scaring the living hell out of the Miami Dolphins. Because the Giants pick number four, the Dolphins pick number five. And I'm going to throw it in the San Diego Ch- or the Los Angeles Chargers pick number six. We're going to save that for a little bit later, though. Okay. Gettleman has to get on the phone with the Dolphins, and he has to convince them that their number five pick is not going to be good enough to take the quarterback they want. And the Dolphins are taking a quarterback. 
Make no mistake about that. He needs to convince the Dolphins, hey, the Chargers have made me a great offer. They want to move over you because they want to get their guy. And I don't know I don't know if that guy is going to be Tua from Alabama, Tua Tagle, Tagle, like, like Tagga Bailoa. I hate his name. Um, because of the advanced injury history he has, including the hip uh, surgery that he had uh, after, after last season. Right. Uh, there's Justin Herbert from Oregon is out there. Uh, and those two guys are more than likely going to be the two picks. He needs to convince the Dolphins, hey, the Chargers are on me. The Chargers desperately want this pick, and they're making me a good offer. you got to make a better offer. And he needs to get something from the Dolphins to move up that one spot. And it almost doesn't even matter what he gets. As long as he gets something, he's not going to get like another first round pick. He's going to get the pick behind his and (coughs) maybe a second rounder. I don't know, maybe something, but he's going to get something and it's going to be something of value. It's not going to be like the first rounder and a sixth rounder. That's not going to get it done, but he'll get something of value. All right. So he needs to make the dolphins pay to move up that spot so that they get some measure of certainty because everybody in the draft wants certainty. All right. So as soon as that happens, then he needs to go to the chargers and say, Hey, you know what? The Raiders, the Raiders got a bunch of picks. They're they're, they're ready to send me two of them because they want, they want to move up. You know, John Gruden, Chucky, he loves, he loves Tua, wants Tua bad. He's hoping he falls to him. He goes, but he's making me an offer. He goes, because now the Giants are going to be a five. So now the Chargers, he's got to say to him, hey, you want to move up? You want to make sure you get your guy and have a quarterback for next season? Hey, you, you got to send me some picks. You know? It, he's, yeah, he's, I, I I don't know. I mean, it, it, do, you, do you maybe get a player instead, you know, and – you, know, no, someone you don't you want. Need. You don't want. You don't guy. You don't want guys under contract because guy. Any guy. Any guys under contract, unless they're like a first or second year player, then soon enough they're going to be expensive. So you you want you want controllable years with football players, and you can you can get them for for up to six years. If, and then, but that's if you franchise tag them for the last season. But you can get them up to six years with, with a, a reasonable contract. That's that's the key to salary cap management. So you don't necessarily want players. You want you want rookies. You want draft picks. You want guys who you can pick and develop and 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 bring up in your system. Okay. But Gettleman needs needs to to make that same pitch to the Chargers after he makes it to the Dolphins. You know, and and he needs to be you know like hey you know wouldn't it be great if we had palm trees in New Jersey and. Uh, you know, every time, uh, every time I look at the news, I see all these people out in LA and they're all jogging around and, you know, what's the deal with that? And, you know, and then he needs to get into the football. Hell of a thing letting Phillip Rivers go because Phillip Rivers, the longtime Chargers quarterback is now in Indianapolis playing for the Colts. Um, Hard to believe, you know? And, and then he's going to say, you know, I'm ha- I have offers for the pick. People want the pick. You don't want to lose Tua. You don't want right, to lose right. your chance for him. And, and, and uh, you know, what, Jordan Love is going to take over for Rivers? It's like, I don't think that's going to work with the fan base. you got to have that big-name QB. You know, you got to pull a little bit of that Kevin Costner from draft day, you know, like some of that stuff. Well, also, you know, the, the thing about the Chargers, brother, they're in L.A. now, and they're, they are the number two team. Well, actually, no, I take – yeah, they're the number two team. They're not yeah, the number the one are, team. The Rams, the Rams are the number one team because the Rams are – you know, they were really good two years ago. They weren't so good last year, but they were – they were real, you know. They were pretty mediocre last year. So the Rams are, you know, trying to build it back up. But the Chargers weren't weren't good at all last year. You know, right? They were, they were also mediocre. Well, you know, it's it's funny because Los Angeles. I mean, the, the so the you Chargers know, and, and left. They, they want San Diego. Yeah, they shouldn't have left San Diego. So, well, that's what they decided to business move. What can I tell you, brother? I know, but they so, shouldn't have. So anyway, I'm sorry. But anyway, anyway. You know, he Gettleman needs to needs to convince the Chargers and scare the hell out of the Chargers just the same way he scared the hell out of the Dolphins, and and just say at the end of the conversation, hey, I'm going to need a couple of picks. Send me some picks. Send me a second and a third, or send me whatever. And he need, I mean, he can turn one draft pick into probably five or six 
And I, he's not going to get another number one. Like he, nobody's going to give him. Like the Chargers aren't going to come come in and say, "All right, we'll give you the, the six and next year's number one." That's not going to happen. That's too much. No, no GM with a brain is going to do that. But if you can get a second rounder, another second rounder, or a second and a third, you get you're going to wind up with quality players. And especially in this draft, a lot of wide receivers out there, which the Giants desperately need wide receivers. So the Jets, by the way. But there's also a lot of good offensive linemen. Basically, those are the two main areas that the Giants need to address. In fact, the Jets need to address the same areas. But they need to protect Daniel Jones, second-year quarterback. They need they need to get receivers for Jones to throw to, even though he's probably he's definitely in better shape than Darnold because he's got uh, Golden Tate and um, uh, I'm blanking on the guy from the kid from Alabama who they took last year with the fifth round pick. But you know they need they need those. You know they have at least a couple of receivers of Giants. The Saquon Barkley can catch out of the backfield, um, but that you know that's what Gettleman needs to do. He can turn one pick into six picks, wind up at number six, and still take someone like Isaiah Simmons, which is the linebacker from Clemson, who they they're predicted to take at number four. So trading down two spots wouldn't affect where they pick. Because right, other right. teams are trading up to take quarterbacks. Okay. So uh, I, I don't understand. I don't even understand why one trade hasn't happened yet. That that's what's aggravating me at this point because I I, I don't get it. You know, you you would think that that maybe I don't know maybe maybe nobody's making making a deal yet or nobody wants to give their best offer yet or, or get them is just waiting and that's you know and that's all well well and good but you know it's it's something that that. You know, needs to happen before Thursday eight o'clock, and before uh, we get to see the inside of Roger Goodell's house. Yeah, well, it could be in the, in the NFL offices too. You know, I'm sure they have a, 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 a nice conference room. That's what I would do it. I would do it in the conference room. Uh, you know, they, I'm sure they have a setup there. You know, why do it at your house? I mean, it's easier. Well, so I'm sure they have a setup. So then, well, so then, then uh, uh, the commissioner doesn't need to travel; he can stay home. Right, right. Anyway, brother, uh, just a programming reminder. Don't forget about Profuma Detale. Every Thursday, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., join Rita as uh, she looks into the culture of Italy and the music of Italy and the Italian thing, too. And we're Italian, so we know what she's talking about. And, of course, I'm not sure. I'm not sure with her, Tim. I've never talked to her, uh, but I'm not sure if it's gravy or sauce with her. So, you know. That's a good question, brother. Yeah, I, I, you know, if Rita's out there listening, gravy or or, or sauce. We, I, we I, go with, I say I say sauce, but I like gravy better. I I like sauce. I never liked gravy. Gravy is the brown stuff. Some people might call it gravy. And of course, right after Rita, also on on Thursday is the sock op with Steve Dassa playing the doo op music from the fifties and sixties. Every Thursday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. right here on 90.3 WHPC. Now, the Jets, brother, at number 11. One of By the way, need... bro, just so people know, Darry, Darry Slayton was the Giants receiver I was trying to think of. Okay. Uh, what do the Jets need at number 11? You know, obviously they need someone to work with Sam Darnold. Um, but, you know, they, they got their choice of a wide receiver. Or Do they really need an offensive lineman? I don't know. Yes, they um, need, they need... They, they still need offensive linemen. Uh, Joe Douglas has done a nice job in the offseason collecting offensive linemen. He, he's made some upgrades to the line, but the Jets line is still not not even I, – I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't even call it very good. It certainly is nowhere near elite. Um, the Jets certainly need offensive linemen, uh, yes. which is, is probably the direction I would go if I'm Joe Douglas. It's going to be tempting to take a wide receiver, especially if somebody like Jerry Judy is still on the board at number eleven. Jerry Judy from Alabama, uh, but I, I think I think you need to go with a big guy, and you need to get the guy who is going to be the anchor of your of your line for the next ten years. And, and whoever that is, I don't know. Andrew Thomas from Georgia has been the name linked most with the Jets, or at least that's what I've seen. Right. Um, and you know there there's there are a, a, a pretty decent amount of, of of quality linemen in this draft. They are going to go off the board 
before the receivers do. So you're talking about guys like uh, Tristan Wirfs from Iowa. He, he's going to be – he's going to – he's clearly a top 10 pick. He won't even make it to the Jets. Um, somebody like uh, Mikai Becton from Louisville, another guy who more than likely won't make to the Jets. Right. So you, you, you have a lot of O-line guys, and, you know, the Jets won't be able to pick uh, Jerry Judy or his teammate Henry Ruggs III or C.D. Lamb from Oklahoma, you know, guys like that. But there are plenty of other wide receivers – who may not be as good as those guys, but will be very productive NFL receivers. Uh, now, one guy who I highlighted, because I've, I've been looking through the rankings and I've been like kind of looking through the low part of the rankings. Right. Or, or, you know, like the low, like when I say low, I'm talking like 9, 10, 11, you know, those kinds of rankings. Uh, there is a kid out of USC named Michael Pittman Jr. If the Jets could get him, excuse me, swallowed wrong. Uh, if the Jets could get him in the second round, that would be uh, just a phenomenal get because he's a, he's a kid. He could be a big time receiver, and it wouldn't he wouldn't be in the first round because, like I said, there's probably there's probably going to be at least eight wide receivers going the first round, and that's a, that's a big number. That's a lot of wide receivers. <laughs> it is. It's a lot, but that's how that's how deep the wide receiver group is this season. So if, if you get that many receivers out in the first round and there are still good receivers in the second round who can, who can be you know, game changers, difference makers kind of people, that, that's why you go with the offensive linemen first. Because there will still be good linemen in the second and third rounds, but to get a really elite uh, offensive lineman, you need to pick that guy early. And, and that – that is, I think that's what Joe Douglas is going to do. And you know, remember, this is Joe Douglas's first draft with the Jets. Right, right. You know, remember, uh, Mike McCagnan was was fired not long after last season's draft, and and that was that was the move that made absolutely no sense then. It still makes no sense. Um, but that was uh, that, uh, that that kind of out of nowhere power struggle that that came up with uh, Adam Gase. Obviously, Gase won the power struggle. <laughs> And he brought in his own guy to be the GM. So, you know, it's, it's, it's time to make something happen. It's time for Joe Douglas to, to, you know, to finally, you know, really start earning his money. Anybody can throw money around in free agency and, you know, kind of pick guys and, and sign guys in, in the free agent period in the NFL. But the draft is where you build teams. And the draft is, is where, you know, where you're going to see improvement. And it, it's it's that time now for the Jets. It's time for Douglas to start making a name for himself in this town. We'll see if that happens. You know, starting Thursday night, right? And uh, who else is uh, going to be a big pick in this draft? Who, uh, name wise, uh, give me some names that um, you know, you know, the first well, two I mean, or three. The first, know. I mean, the first obviously Joe Burrow going to Cincinnati is a no brainer. Joe, Joe Burrow was the you know the best college quarterback by far this season. Um, Chase Young. By the way, by the way, I do want to say everything that I said about the Giants gets canceled out if if somehow the Washington Redskins do something stupid like like trading the number two pick. Because if Chase Young somehow falls to the Giants, you you well, I was going to say you run that card up to the podium, but there is no podium. So so you you send the email or you send the message or the text or whoever, however they're going to notify the NFL. Hey, this is who we pick. And you get Chase Young out there as quick as possible. Because if somebody trades up to two, first of all, they're going to have to give a ton to move up to two. But if they do, then they are getting their choice of quarterback. And if they they think that that's worth Chase Young, then if I'm the Giants and Chase Young falls to me at number four, thank you very much. Because he is probably the best player in this draft. Well, it's it's the red it's the Redskins, brother. So you you expect them to do the worst thing. So I, I expect I, they're they're like the Knicks of the NFL. So you know, I actually, expect, I actually, Timmy, I, 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 you know what? You you ask Redskins fans, and our cousins are Redskins fans. They do not like Danny Schneider at all. Um, at no, all. they are convinced that the Redskins are the worst franchise in pro sports. Yes, and I, and, I would, and I would agree they, with that. you could you could you could make a case for that. You certainly could make a case for that. I can, you know, I there was there was there was there was a time many years ago. I, I want to say about ten or fifteen years ago, 
where I was telling people the Jets were the worst franchise in pro sports. And that's not the case anymore. They're still not, not, you know, they're still not a good franchise, but there's, they're not the worst. But there was a time frame there, uh, where everything the Jets did was wrong. And part of the reason with the Redskins is Daniel Snyder is just, he's too stubborn. He wants to do everything his way and he's not willing to listen to anybody else. And he doesn't know what he's doing. Well, he hasn't known for a long time. So, I mean, he's been it's, it's, for a long time. I know. He doesn't he's mean just, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, I know. He's not a good owner. He's, you know, it seems like ever since they got that stadium, and it's like 15, 20 years ago now. Uh, that in, in that range, he, yeah. Yeah, that the, the, the team just lost all focus. That he lost all focus. He all he cared about was getting that stadium. Um, and he got you know, the stadium. In, in he, suburban he, he, got a, he got a he got a bigger stadium because they had this this ridiculously long season ticket waiting list, and he wanted to sell more tickets. And now yep. they can't even fill the place because nope. so, because people people are disgusted with the team. They're disgusted with mediocrity, and they're disgusted with him because he's a stubborn fool who refuses to do it anybody else's way. And he, he's the worst kind of owner. One of the, one of the, one of the ones who says, "Well, I'm paying the bills, so so listen to me." Yeah, Dude, he, you don't know you don't know what you're doing. So no, we we shouldn't be listening to you. But that's and also, the problem. And also, you know, he just there's there's such a. I mean, think of this, brother. The the waiting list for the Redskins was a, a premier thing to be on in the DC yeah. area, and and now there's no list. It's 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 like the Jets. Jets used to have a premier list, and then they right. started those uh, those PSLs and right. and the and they have no one on a waiting list anymore. And now you can get right. tickets any day you want because people who have those PSL things that were – and the same with the Giants too – were so ripped off. And, you know, you just feel bad for them that they paid for it. But, you know, they paid for it. So that's not something I would have paid for, but some people did. Yeah, and, just to explain to somebody who might not know, PSL is a personal seat license which requires a fan to, to pay a fee for a seat before you buy the tickets. You're just paying for the – for the seat, then you have to buy the tickets that allow you to sit in that seat. So, right, and those, right. those are those are you know anywhere from ten thousand to fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, way crazy. way overpriced. Uh, so, are we done with the NFL, brother? Uh, well, I mean, just you you asked about names, brother. The uh, yes, like I said, Chase Young. Chase Young is expected to go number two to the Redskins. I can't imagine that they're going to trade that pick. The, the Lions, like I said, are possibly looking to trade. And the Lions could wind up doing everything that I said the Giants should do. Because the Lions the Lions could trade the pick down to, to the Dolphins at five and then could still pick the guy that they want, who was Jeff Okuda from Ohio State, his cornerback. Uh, and they could also move down another, another spot to the Chargers if they wanted to. But the, Okuda is the guy who they want because they desperately need a corner. And... Simmons seems to be the guy the Giants want, unless they're looking maybe at Tristan Wirfs from Iowa, you know, like one of those, like I said, one of those hog molly linemen that uh, the Gettleman loves so much. Um, but those, you know, those guys and the wide receivers are going to be the big names in this draft. And, and we're going to, we're going to wait and see where they go. And, you know, Jordan Love is kind of a wild card in this thing because he's the quarterback from Utah State who people see as being a little bit below uh, Burrow and Tua and uh, – I'm blanking on his name um, – uh, Herbert. So right. – and I don't know. Some people some people like love the more they see of him, but Utah State is – you know, kind of draws people back, and his senior year was, was not very good. Uh, and there's some chatter that he might wind up going to the Patriots because obviously the Patriots need a quarterback. And, and will the Patriots try to trade up into the top five? Who knows? So yeah, I mean the, the, the Patriots. You know, Tom Brady. You know, he might be old, but he's still Tom Brady. So we got to see what's going to happen. You know, brother. Huh? Just before we switch, wait, wait, what are you yeah. talking about? Tom, Tom Brady, Brady is Tom Brady's not Colin. on the Patriots anymore. I know, I know that's what I said. I know that, but they got still got to replace him. I and even though he's forty thousand years old, you still got to replace him. And even if he was still playing for him, you'd, he's still a better quarterback than most of. the Quarterbacks in the league, so well, you got you got to replace him because he left. You know, I know that Not because know of his that. age. <laughs> yeah, but he but they didn't sign him because of his age. They didn't want to pay him all that money. You know, they didn't want to because, pay. They didn't want to pay a forty three year old quarterback twenty five million dollars like uh, like the Buccaneers seemed uh, seemed happy to do. I would have done it. I would have done it. Not if me. I, if I, Not me. I, you know what? He 
he didn't play super fantastic last year, but they they were okay. You know, I would I would I would not have done that, brother. Not my not my uh, not my decision. Not my move. Anyway, brother, I, one I'm, more thing about the NFL up. before we switch uh, topics. Um, as we know, our uh, our president uh, oh. just sort of admitted that okay, we we need more testing, which uh, the governors have been saying they need. And he keeps saying, "Well, it's you guys." You know, he, you know, Trump likes to think the, the articles of confederation are going on right now, not with not the Constitution. I, and the pre- I, and I've the, been talking about I've been talking about testing on this show now for about a month. Right. So the governors keep saying we can't afford to pay for all this testing, which is true, because yeah. they have to then raise money. The government, the federal government, can raise money and and do things like that. So finally, I think from what I've been seeing on the news, it seems like. Uh, the federal government's going to get involved much more with testing because nothing changes in this country without finding out who has uh, the coronavirus and who doesn't. Now, Testing is that, the key to moving forward. Right, but I was thinking of this the other day, brother. Let's say the, the NFL comes back, and it's going to, and let's say they actually have people in the stands. But let's say because there wasn't enough testing that – the coronavirus comes back in the fall. Second wave. That's what people are scared and the, about. And people are scared of this right now. And it, there's a lot of people have talked about it, that during the summer it's going to go down because that's what happens. And then when the colder weather starts again, it's it, it could end up either canceling the NFL season or delaying it. And I was thinking, you know, the uh, Trump hates the NFL because the NFL would never allow him to be an owner. Uh, this could be his way of getting back at the NFL by not having testing. You know, it's just a thought process. I'm not sure if that's going to last at this point, but it I'll is. Something I'll tell you that what, brother. It, it's it it it's it makes sense. I'll tell you that. I know. Trump Trump is is a, is a very vindictive guy. Yep. He, he does yep. like he does like to exact his revenge. Yep. And this been, would be perfect to the that's NFL. Been, that's been proven time after time. In, but then in, again, in this, but then again, brother. Imagine you know you're, you're the guy who really caused the cancellation of the NFL season. Uh, you know that yeah, would I mean, be that's, that's a big know, thing. Let's, let's let's put it this. I mean, I, I, I've been very outspoken about testing. I and have testing. Too. Testing has to be a national priority. You can't have fifty states doing fifty different things with testing. It needs to nope. be national. And for some reason, Trump wants to push everything on the governors. It's it's like he thinks nothing is his job. But then he'll call all of the commissioners of the various uh, sports leagues and, and sports and wrestling and MMA and whatnot. And he'll say, oh, well, we got to get this done. We got to get going here. We got to, you know, we got to, you know, start this up so the country doesn't go crazy. Well, then do something. Do you can't job. have both. You can't have both. You can't, you know, as much as we, people are talking about playing games in, in empty arenas, um, we all know the players curse like crazy, brother. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Uh, we, we know for a fact that if you have an empty arena and you have 15 or well, 10 guys on uh, the ice or the rink or whatever, uh, and there's no, there's no crowd to absorb the noise, you're going to hear them. You hear a lot of bad screams. words, brother. Yeah, and that, so, that was that was something when I was talking last week about you know baseball's plan to to have um, nobody in the stands and have players sitting in the stands instead of the dugout and and you know all of this kind of ridiculous stuff that they're, that they're talking about. Uh, that was one thing that I really hadn't thought about, but it, it it occurred to me like literally like about a half an hour after we did the show yesterday or last week. That these guys curse all the time, you know. I mean, that was the one the one thing when I covered NBA games uh, during during my sports writing career. You hear everything. Oh sure, there is all kinds of profanity going on in an NBA court. Right. The refs don't refs don't care about. It. Well, they're not as supposed as, to. As, as well, because because when guys get frustrated, they'll they'll you know they'll drop an f bomb. Or you know whatever you know whatever word is, is their word of choice, but they're not saying it to anybody. 
So if you're just if you're just cursing out loud because you're you're frustrated with yourself, or you didn't make a play that you wanted to play, or somebody beat you off the dribble and and got into the lane and scored a layup, whatever. Kevin Garnett was one of the guys who who was you know he was the loudest, and and you know Shaq was another one, but and and Kobe too, as a matter of fact. But you know who's the guy who uses the most profanity in you know, on, in the golf tour? Tiger Woods. Yeah, yeah. But if you're talking about an NBA game, I, I don't know how you broadcast an NBA game in an empty arena because you couldn't have a seven-second delay because you wouldn't hear anything. No, but they they might just say, you know, maybe they, they only have a couple of mics. They don't have any um, court mics. That's the only way really to cover. But you know if what? You, if, you, if you put the mics, like, like if you attach them maybe to, like, the second deck or something like that. No, I actually, we, but you know what? Though the the uh, the uh, announcers' mics are going to pick it up anyway. So probably because it's so because it's so empty, it's just going to rattle everywhere. So I mean, it, it'll be interesting to see how um, how that you know plays out. I I think you know what if if you could do it, you know you could put six thousand people in the Coliseum. You just have your your six feet. You know, it's, it's a it's a nightmare spread. waiting to happen, bro. What do you do when people have to go to the bathroom? You can't. Well, you really can't. Well, Six thousand people is much less than thirteen, fourteen thousand. It, it, it doesn't matter. You're going to have people if, stand stand a shoulder to shoulder in a men's room. Well, you 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 do alternate stalls then. It, it's not. You're going to have to police people too much, and too many people wouldn't do it. People wouldn't be wearing face masks. I mean, we've well, already. I don't seen, think I, they. I, you know, maybe they don't sell beer. You know. You know. So. Good luck. You, know, you don't sell. Well, you, uh, that's where they make their money is the beer. But it's well, interesting to say. But look, look at it this way. La- yesterday, I, I went outside for the first time in a month. Right, I know that. And 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 I, I had my face covered. I, I wrapped a scarf around my face. Right. Uh, you know, wool scarf. So it was it was you know good uh, you know good coverage. And the 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 drugstore that I went to was a block and a half from my apartment. I walked past three people that weren't wearing any kind of face covering. Now, the mayor of New York said, do not leave your house without covering your face. Right. I heard him. And these, and these people are, are just walking on the street like it's like, like nothing. Like it's I no told, big deal. I told you, Tim, there would be a, a rebellion down the road. It's not a rebellion. It's stupidity. Story. It's stupidity, but it's, a, it's also a rebellion. I told you this. It's, well, it, it's bound to happen. And, you know, that's, that's just a whole other thing, brother, because – People think, well, you know, I didn't get it now, and I'm okay. Well, you know, and that's what it's. It's tough to change people's th- feelings, brother. Well, anyway, my, brother, my my main point here is is that if sports does do come back and they do it in front of empty arenas, that e- either either the announcers are going to have to have to say something before the game and say, look, you're going to hear a lot of language that you're not used to hearing because you haven't been able to hear it because twenty thousand people drown it out. Well, they also the the leagues also have to go to the players' association and say, "Hey, we're not getting any money from attendance. We have to cut your salary somewhere." And yeah, that's happening. That's going to happen. You well, know, that, they haven't that, oh, they haven't announced it yet. So they haven't announced um, it yet, but they will. Uh, well, if it goes because, back because I because mean, because they don't know how much of the season they're going to lose. It's it's well, going to everything. Everything will be prorated in terms of how much season they lose and how much season they're going to have. Well, if you're playing games, you're getting TV money. So, you know, and, and I know what, that's why you do it. It's for the TV money. It's not a bad thing. So, yeah. Uh, but not everyone is going to be happy about it. Okay, brother, we're, we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, the WNBA very quickly did their draft this uh, past couple of days. And um, sort of, um, I think the way the NFL might be doing is copying what the uh, WNBA did. Yeah, you, know, you have your announcer. You, you have the, your. If you watch the WNBA draft on Thursday, that that's what the NBA uh, that's what the NFL draft is going to, going to look like. It's pretty much right. the same thing, right? You know, except except uh, you know, except Roger Goodell will have a much nicer house than than the WNBA commission. Right. So, well, you know, there was a nice touch. I saw one of the um, the, the 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 people who got picked, and they it was in the fa- the house. It was the family house. They were all, they were all right next to each other, but. They threw a confetti in the air when she was picked. Uh, and, that was, uh, uh, they... that was the, the the woman from uh, Princeton. That was Bella Allery. Yeah, yeah, that who's, was it. She... Who, whose father whose father was a, a punk who played at Duke. Oh, okay. Mark, well. Mark Allery. 
Yeah, she played so, at Princeton, six foot four. She said, yeah. it seems like a decent player, but you know, it's not hard to be a good player in the Ivy League. I mean, we're talking about one of the least com- competitive conferences in the country, but we'll see. We'll see what she does. She seems like a, a very good player. I, I'm, I'm not going to be uh, judgmental on her. Some obviously somebody thought she was good enough to take early in the first round. So uh, you know, she does a lot right. of things well, and she's you know she's six foot four, so you know, she can shoot from the outside. And we'll see if uh, is the WNBA cancel this season yet or, or delay it? Yeah, they're they're it. still they're still waiting to see because I mean the the advantage for them is it's it's such an abbreviated season. I mean what is it thirty two games, thirty four games, or something like yeah. that that they could pack it into a month and a half if they had to. You know if they sure. want to play games like every other day or something, they'd run the players down. I mean they really it would it would be it would be a slog for the players. Um, but it's something that they could do, and they could jam it in and, and get it finished. You know, maybe by you know, I think their season usually ends around somewhere in August or something. Maybe they could end it in October instead. And right, they would right. have to start. They would have to start it in in like mid to late August and do it that way. But you know, the only reason they do it that way is because it it, it allows them at least a tiny bit of, of breathing space in the sports landscape. And, and if they, if they push it back into November or something, they're just going to get lost in, 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 in the NFL and, and hockey and basketball will be starting back. Well, I, 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 I think they'd have to be done before the NBA started, but you know, the NBA still hasn't finished this season yet. So, yeah. so let's, so, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Yeah. We, we can't get too far. <laughs> um, you know, and, and we should say that the New York Liberty are now owned by the uh, the consortium that owns the Brooklyn Nets. Yes, Joseph Sy. And, right. So, um, and they're going to play in the Barclays Center. They're not going to be playing up in Westchester in that. Which is that good. Hovel. Yeah, it's good. At least they'll have because a place where they put people in. Though, I, people, who knows people, if that'll happen this year? People need to understand the Liberty. Their, their number one pick was was Sabrina Ionescu, who is. An incredible player. I, this is I don't like pick pick a great NBA draft pick from the last thirty years. I mean, pick anybody you want that went number one overall, and right. she is at least as good as that person in women's basketball. Um, she played at Oregon. She's a five foot eleven point guard. She is the only player. This is male or female in NCAA history to. Score more than two thousand points, grab more than one thousand rebounds, and dish more than one thousand assists in her career. It's just her. No male has done that. No other female has done that. Right, right. So right. this woman is a baller, and she will make the Liberty better. But that being said, that was the easy part for the Liberty. We're going to take Sabrina. She's going to be the face, not only the face of the franchise, she's going to very quickly become one of the faces of the league. And then the Liberty did nothing but put wing players around her. I don't understand what they were doing with this draft. Um, right. They tr- they traded Tina Charles, who was a center, who was by far their best player last year, the, the uh, former UConn player, who's, who's outstanding. and What a great low post player she is. And they trade her to get in, in a three-team trade that wound up netting them two more number one picks. And that's that's fine. If you're going to make that trade, make that trade. But they didn't replace her. Right, they, didn't get, right, right. they didn't get an inside player who could score. You know, their, their second first-round pick at number nine, they took Megan Walker, who was a 6'1 shooting forward out of UConn, supposed, supposed to be the best shooter in the draft. So I can't I can't fault that pick. Good pick there. At number twelve, which is the last pick in the first round, twelve team league, they take Jasmine Jones, a six foot guard from Louisville, who she's had one one season in college where she scored double figures, and that was her senior year. I don't understand how the how how Jasmine Jones winds up as a first round pick. Doesn't right. make sense. Well, um, it's it's good to see it's good to see that it was actually covered by ESPN. It was uh, Rebecca Lobo was good as a commentator and. Um, yeah, they've been doing. They've been of, covering the draft for the last couple of years. It, it, it's it's a quick it's a quick show because it's only three rounds, and the second and third rounds they don't even really do a whole lot with it. They just or, they'll just say, "Oh, or, four more picks were made, and here's the names and the players and positions and whatnot." And, right, and that's the way it should be. You, I mean, actually, yeah, if you follow them as basketball, you know the names. Right, and, and and that's the way it really should be all drafts. But you know, 
they make it Probably. into a a show. Yeah, Tim, we got two minutes left, brother, before we have to say goodbye. And Big Ed's coming up next at ten o'clock with the Good Gold Show. So don't even touch the dial. Um, how, how'd you like the Bulls special, brother, on ESPN? Um, it's it's not a it's not a positive thing, I think, for Michael Jordan. But oh, it's not it's not going it's not going to be a positive thing for Michael Jordan. Uh, you know, my it, the mask is going to come off of, of Jordan, and and people are still going to love him anyway, and they're not going to care, but. I, I talked to a friend of mine who covered the NBA back in the Jordan days. He covered he covered the Nets for for the record for for many years, right? And, and I asked him. I said I asked him about Jordan. I said, "What? How would you describe Jordan?" And, and he, he he came back to me, sociopath, because that's what Michael Jordan was. He had a, he had to drag a team, and he had to get get the best out of guys because because he needed them to get to a place they needed to get to to win a title. But he was a lunatic. But isn't that, a, and, isn't that what you want on a, a, a team? Is someone to not, drag? Not the... to that extent. This, he, he screamed, he belittled, he insulted, and, and these are his teammates. All right? He, he, he even he punched Steve Kerr in the face one time. Surprised that's he not, let him get away with it. not necessarily what you want from a teammate. No, no, no. You want intensity, and you want you want that guy who, who wants to win and, and is, is going to lead you there. You don't want punching teammates in the face. No, that's true. But, you know, then again, the Yankees of 78 were not the uh, – they were oh, no, not they the didn't holding get along. the hands. They, they didn't, didn't get, get along, along there, was no, there was no kumbaya moments that season. You know, the the, 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 80, the Mets of, I think, 88 had a couple of fights or 86. 86, uh, yeah. sure. Yeah, they, 86. They more than team in the league. Yeah, so they, they, they had their share of fights too. So, um, both, you know, both, it's it, – both, both with opposing teams and with each other. Yeah, so it, it's – you know, it, it – it's interesting how you look at it. I mean, you know what? When I mean, he, I always thought that Jordan was so much better than the rest of his uh, teammates, including Scottie Pippen. Mm. I never thought – I thought Scottie Pippen was uh, a little bit overrated, that if he was on another team, I don't think that he would be as no, well Scott, thought out. I, I disagree with you, brother. Scottie really? Pippen, okay. Scottie, Scottie Pippen was a ball. He, he, yeah, he, but he, I, mean, I, don't, they, I don't think they would be six world champions. I think there'd be maybe one if it was just Scottie Pippen. So, well, I mean, if you take if you take away one of the, one of the greats of all time, and a lot of what the guy who a lot of people think is the greatest of all time, you got that's gonna that's gonna it's, it's gonna hurt any team. Yeah, I know. Anyway, what are, you, what are you replacing Jordan with? That's what would determine if they won championships. Well, that's true. But then again, they didn't do anything. Clyde, while... If you replace him with Clyde Drexler, you win titles still. Right, but uh, when Michael Jordan was playing baseball for two years, the Bulls did nothing. So no, they 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 were. Pretty good still, but they didn't. Uh, obviously, they weren't winning titles, right? Because, like I said, anyway, they, they, they replaced him with Steve Kerr. Brother, brother, we gotta go. We gotta go, brother. Go. Anyway, go. It's, it's time. Uh, so, thank you, brother Tim. You're. Uh, we've been doing from the press box. I'm Rob Leonard. He's Tim Leonard. Tim, you're Twitter at at Real Tim Leonard. Big Ed's coming up next at ten o'clock with the Good Gold Show. Thanks to Sean Novak for keeping us all together. We'll see you next Monday with more sports from the press box. Take care.